what am I going to tell someone, you know, who's 60 year old with a rotator cuff tear, you know, take allopurinol and, yeah, and, and decrease your glucose? Well, if they want to live to 90, yes, but that's not going to address the shoulder problem now, right? This is why, as I hope we'll get into, the earlier we pay attention to this, the better we're going to be, because you don't want to bring these tendons and this arthritic burden, inflammatory burden through your formative decades mm -hmm. and your decades mm -hmm. in early adulthood, because they're going to result in problems. These are all area under the curve issues. The longer that you suffer from high cholesterol, yes, ApoB is causative of heart disease and it's worse in the presence of inflammation. <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> um, the higher your, your A1C is and your glucose is over the longer period of time, again, area under the curve, the worse the downstream consequences are going to be for you. Not only for your eyes, not only your risk of dementia, uh, your risk of kidney failure, uh, hypertension, um, NAFLD or, or fatty liver. But in my world, the higher the risk of tendon-related issues, more severe pain, um, uh, tendon tears, uh, overuse injuries, mm. um, and more significant pain with arthritis and other maladies. Dr. Lux, welcome to a whole new level. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Means, and please call me Howard. Okay, well, same with me. Please call me Casey. Um, I, <laughs> I was telling you before we started, I am really one of your one of your biggest fans. I love what you are doing to change the way we think about a subspecialty like uh, orthopedics or orthopedic surgery and really broadening understanding of, of joint health and musculoskeletal health. And I, <laughs> I will tell the listeners briefly about some interactions we've had recently. Like we got connected through levels and, uh, have done some content work together for the levels blog. And I've shared your blog posts about the relationship between metabolic health and joint health with so many people, but then more recently, I personally reached out to you because I think you're the only orthopedic surgeon in the country that like, I feel super like totally <laughs> philosophically aligned with because I was doing back squats and I ripped I, like what a 1.5 centimeter piece of cartilage off my femoral head cartilage. And I went to the doctor, to the orthopedic surgeon. And he told me with a strong recommendation that I should do this two-stage, very invasive surgery called a Macy procedure that would have me like harvesting cartilage, growing it in a lab, putting it back in my knee. And I, it just did not feel right to me. It felt like, it felt like a very turbo decision for a young person who was not actually in that much pain. So I emailed you and asked your recommendation and I would just love to put that question back to you in front of you know, the, the podcast listeners, like when you hear something like that, like, okay, someone's had a cartilage defect in their knee. Um, how do you approach something like that? Yeah. Great question. And it's not as easy as you think to answer. We are so much more than a simple finding on an MRI. And what we fail to understand as well is what are findings very typical of active people who are squatting heavy weights, running distances in an orthopedic practice? Uh, is it unusual to have a small lateral condyl cartilage defect? Uh, it turns out, no, as I shared with you, uh, I got MRIs of both knees long ago just because I wanted to see them. I, I was interested. I have meniscus tears and cartilage defects and bone marrow edema in both knees. Yet I was actively running 30 to 40 miles a week, and I still am. So we dove into your process uh, and the fact that you had little to no pain and were ready to go back out and start working out and moving. And we realized that this may, this may have been the day that you realized that you had a defect, but it may not have been the day the defect came about. We didn't see edema or inflammation in the bone. We didn't see sharp edges around the defects. So there were a lot of hints there that it, maybe it wasn't acute. Um, maybe we were seeing the early uh, part of a more, I hate the word, degenerative process. Uh, but just one of those things that we accumulate 
through the decades, especially with poor metabolic health, et cetera, which we'll touch on later. Um, and look, you are feeling fine. Uh, it's very hard to cut into a knee of someone who's feeling fine and uh, expose them to the risks of surgery, the risks of complications, and the risks of just opening the knee. The knee doesn't like that. No joint likes that. And it will degenerate a little just because of that. And I shared with you, I think, that I was part of the original research um, done in New York City at the Hospital for Joint Diseases on this cartilage-based uh, procedure. And we found a lot of these, these defects recurred. So if we were doing them on degenerative defects or, or defects that were coming about, not because of an acute trauma, but just over time, that they would come back again a few years later. Um, so I think we just, uh, we put out the fire, we put out the thought that, oh my God, I have to fix this immediately. And you step back and you're doing fine. And we really don't have research saying that we're heading off arthritis or a problem in the future. I, I really hate the idea of trying to do something now because we might affect something in the future because we might not. And if something bad happens now because we did this, then you're definitely gonna have a problem in the future. Um, and look at you, you're doing wonderfully. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing, you know, conversation because you did, you know, you shared with me, like what you said, that you can take a lot of patients who are older or even young and do MRIs of their knees. And some people may have structural, you know, architectural sort of defects in the knee or in any joint that doesn't necessarily mean that they all have symptoms. And Correct. that is so fascinating because I think that's very different than how we typically think about like from the surgical world of like, oh, there's a structural problem, we must fix it. And one of the things I think that you had mentioned in your, your note to me was that, um, you know, I actually have it in front of me. So I'm gonna read what you said because I love it and I'd love for you to unpack it a little bit more. Um, it turns out that cartilage issues and early osteoarthritis is often the result of a failure of the innate repair mechanisms that cartilage has. In other words, osteoarthritis is not a mechanical issue. It's a biologic issue. So, so many people I think are thinking about osteoarthritis is like, oh, it's, it's bone on bone, it's cartilage generation. But what do you mean by a joint issue being more of a biologic issue than a mechanical issue? And, and where does that give us room to intervene in a different way? Great question. Um, yeah. So for the longest time, you were told, don't run, it's going to ruin your knees. You know, if you have this sound, you're grinding away cartilage. It's very easy to think of cartilage as like a cheese on a cheese grater or sandpaper on wood, uh, and that these horrible things are happening inside our knee when we run or when we move or when we work out. Well, it turns out it's not. And it turns out that Osteoarthritis in the majority of situations is a failure of a biological repair mechanism. Cartilage is capable of repairing itself, but something screws up the pathway. Not quite sure what's going on there. I am not a researcher in this space. I do follow it closely though. And it appears that um, there are WNT, this is the WNT pathway is one of the pathways involved in repair. And there are new WNT inhibitor, small protein molecules that they're administering to people in phase three studies. And they're showing that they can halt and at times reverse early changes associated with arthritis. So the changes uh, in an arthritic knee are much more complex. The ideology or the cause of osteoarthritis is far more complex than we were initially led to believe. Mm. And in, in sort of my, of course, because I was thinking, okay, I want to do anything non-operative that I could possibly do before being, you know, having someone cut into my knee, which is ironic as I trained as a surgeon, as you did. And I think it's, well, there's the, there's the group of us who, who know that's a powerful tool, but also believe that, well, if there's anything we can do to, to stay out of the operating room, that's ideal because it is a very morbid act, right? I think people, Correct. it's almost like a rite of passage being in a, you know, in the Western world, oh, I'm having my surgery for this or that. But like, when you're actually in that room, like it's, it's a crazy thing that's happening, right? You're cutting Absolutely. into someone's body, huge inflammatory stress, huge stress response. So want to avoid it. 
And so I was doing some digging, like in my sort of limited conception of thinking about like, okay, well, what's going to lead to generate degeneration, maybe like, um, you know, failure of the regenerative pathways and maybe over inflammatory response. That's not well-regulated. And there are some papers, like not strong research, you know, showing like, okay, maybe like fish oil or anti-inflammatory strategies can help with joint health. So how do you think about like the various behavioral, um, modulators of a healthy joint biology? And is there anything that you recommend for patients to essentially create conditions within the joint that lead to the more regenerative capabilities of our tissues? Right. So what I try to uh, get through to patients is our joints are no different than our liver, our heart, our brain, our pancreas, our eyes, our kidneys, et cetera. So as we'll get into poor metabolic health, um, poor glucose control, fatty liver disease, which is now of ep epidemic proportions, um, lipid issues, et cetera, triglycerides. These are causing a cascade of events. And our musculoskeletal system, our tendons, our ligaments, our bones, aren't sitting by in this unscathed. We have a higher risk of osteoporosis. You know, a 50-year-old woman, a 50 to 60-year-old woman is going to spend more time in the hospital because of osteoporosis than heart disease and breast cancer combined. Wow. One in three is going to suffer an osteoporotic fracture. One in five men is going to suffer an osteoporotic fracture. So men are going to suffer too. We are more prone to having tendon tears, ligament tears in situations where we have poor metabolic health. We have glycosylated hemoglobin, right? Your hemoglobin A1C. That's the glucose that's floating around your body. It sticks to things. When it sticks to hemoglobin, your A1C goes up. It sticks to other things too. And if it does that in your eye, it leads to blindness. If it does it in your kidneys, it leads to kidney failure and on and on. Well, if it sticks in parts of your tendons and you have hyperuricemia or high uric acid, you have lipid, uh, or cholesterol deposits, then you're taking away collagen or the tissue that forms tendons and ligaments. So you have an increased risk of rupture because those tissues are weaker. Now, poor metabolic health, as you well know, causes an increase in systemic inflammation. That inflammatory burden is gonna affect our knees. So why this is why people with diabetes or severe insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, have more pain with mild osteoarthritis than someone who's metabolically fit or healthy. And this may be why osteoarthritis and other conditions, which are inflammatory in nature, worsen a little uh, more in people with poor metabolic conditioning and health. So to go back to your original question, um, which at my age, I'm glad I could remember. <sighs> the, uh, <laughs> I really, uh, unless I have someone that I'm walking off a cliff where they're just, they're just miserable and we've lost the chance to uh, start earlier in the process. Um, I can't tell you how common it is. I have someone in front of me, uh, A1C is eight, AST, ALT, because I do ask for labs, 40s, um, triglycerides high, uh, so poor metabolic conditioning. I actually bring a lactate meter to my office sometimes. Uh, so we'll check the baseline lactates. Um, and we dive into the metabolic fitness and health. And they're oftentimes just coming because something's bothering them. They're concerned. Mm -hmm. Do I have a meniscus tear? Do I have this? Um, and I'll dive very deep into why they're experiencing symptoms, why it's not uh, what their MRI shows and how we're going to fix this. Uh, and we'll dive into nutritional stat strategies, exercise strategies. I am not going to stop their exercise. Mm. Um, and so it, it's, it's a tough way to practice medicine these days, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, it's definitely going against the grain because as we know, uh, spending that time to understand a patient's diet, lifestyle, motivation, barriers to healthy living takes a long time. It's not financially incentivized. Whereas like, if you take them in for that really fast arthroscopic procedure and to breed some cartilage, like that is going to build gangbusters. It's fast. They're in and out. You don't have to have those long conversations. And so it's like, 
I mean, I think we, we both know there's such a bias, I think, towards action because of the way our system is, is an incentive, incentivized. And I'd love to talk with you a little bit more about how that plays out since you are taking a, a slightly different route. I mean, a, a very different route in your practice by really focusing on the underlying biologic mechanisms that lead to outcomes that sometimes, you know, we, we think are really where, where operations are our main hammer. And so, but before we jump down that sort of more like systems issue road, I'd be curious to dig in a little bit more to the movement and exercise. Um, you said you do not tell people to stop exercising, even if they have a joint issue. And that was really empowering to me when you mentioned that, because right when I hurt my knee, there was one of the most disconcerting symptoms was, um, just this constant clicking every time I bent my knee and took a step. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this feels to me like it, I need to have surgery to cut off whatever is causing that clicking. And, and it just was very, it's a very uncomfortable sensation. And there was a little bit of pain, maybe two out of 10. And I will say now it's four months later, I have zero clicking and absolutely zero pain and full range of motion. And I have been, and in part because of your prompting and, and other reading, I, I've been extremely active, not, not pushing through pain, but not letting slight discomfort totally deter me. And I think in my mind, before really understanding this a little bit better, I thought, okay, well, if I'm moving and exercising, it's going to cause more inflammation in my knee. And that might be a bad thing, but can you explain why that's probably like not the right way to think about it and how, how patients should have a framework for staying active despite, despite maybe um, some, some joint issues? Yeah, sure. So there's lots to unpack there. <laughs> First of all, throw this out there. There is no 40 something, 50 something or 60 something who's walking out of an operating room and going to feel better in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Not going to feel better in six weeks. They may regret having the surgery in six or eight months. Uh, we just do not respond fast. Um, so it's, it's almost never a quick, easy answer to something that's bothering us. Next, um, it's very hard to unsee your MRI. Uh, <laughs> I have a post on my website of that very title. And it's very true because you've now seen, oh my God, meniscus tear, right? If you throw a 40, 50 something in for an MRI, you're getting back a report that shows six things. A little bit of this, a little tear of this, some fraying of this. And people don't like that. So now every time the knee hurts going forward, it's going to be, of course, because of that little thing on the MRI. Now, um, there are very few reasons to stop exercising. Unless someone has a stress fracture or something that's going to actually worsen, there's no reason to stop them. It is a common misconception that with osteoarthritis, you are causing more harm if you remain active. Yet, the exact opposite is the case. Osteoarthritis, by definition, is less common by evidence, is less common in runners. Maybe that's a self-selection bias because runners keep running. However, they did a study where they had a bunch of runners um, and non-runners, same degree of osteoarthritis on x-rays. They allowed the runners to run at a self-selected pace. The sedentary people remain sedentary. They were more likely, the sedentary group was more likely to have a knee replacement than the group who's running. It turns out that the cartilage likes cyclical loading. Cartilage is not a dead tissue. It's not a sedentary tissue. You know, it, it's, it's like a sloth. <laughs> it doesn't move quickly. It's not exciting. It doesn't beat. It has a very slow metabolism, but it is capable of repair. There is a nourishment process that is going on. That nourishment comes not from blood flow, but from substances in your joint fluid. So the cyclical loading actually helps to get that nourishment and energy source into the cartilage. Um, so maintaining a level of activity is super important. And because I care a lot about bones and fracture risk, it's really important to stay active because of your bone quality and your osteoporosis risk. More important, if you are exercising and you're used to exercising and you rest for as little as two weeks, you've lost about 20% of your muscle strength. So it's pretty dramatic. Not only that, metabolically speaking, you're more insulin resistant, the whole kit and the caboodle. 
So there are very few reasons to stop people from exercising. Most people who are in my office, if you talk to them properly and you ask the right questions, and if you listen to them, they're more concerned that they're not doing harm. They're not there because the pain is so acute that they have to do something. They're there because something hurts. Their best friend said, if you continue running or playing tennis, you're gonna kill your knees. Mm -hmm. um, their primary care might've said the same thing. Um, so, you know, doctors are guilty of this too. So the main message to them is, look, you're okay. We're not gonna get an MRI because it's not gonna change what I'm gonna do. And the result is gonna freak you out. I want you to stay active. I don't want you to decondition. If the pain ever gets to the point where it is the reason why you need to stop, then we need to talk. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I guess I'm thinking about the listener here, maybe thinking, I mean, because pretty much everyone has some ache and pain at some point in their life. And, you know, so the person who's got like the, the rotator cuff pain or they've got the knee pain or they've got just something going on, um, and probably they've been encouraged to have surgery by their doctor because that's, you know, that's the hammer that we've got. Um, and so how, how do you, how do you think people should think through like, okay, I've got some pain, um, that's come on recently. What's sort of like the mental model that people should feel empowered to sort of like latch on to before making the decision to like go under the knife? And are there any, and are there any circumstances in which, um, you know, for something like a, like a joint issue, like a tear or a ligament injury or something like that, or a cartilage injury that you would say, no, actually the best option is to just like have the surgery acutely. Yeah. So when I'm seeing someone in my office, it's going to, you know, I'm not telling people don't come to the office, don't come to see us, right? Yeah. If you have a concern, I want to see you and I want to see what's going on. And based on your complaints, right? Because as we were taught in medical school, if you listen to someone, you're going to know the diagnosis, right? It's actually true. And then your exam is going to confirm that. We don't need an MRI to, for, uh, for a diagnosis. We often get it to confirm a diagnosis based on our suspicion. So based on your examination, on your complaints, we'll decide if an MRI is necessary or not necessary. Based on your symptoms, we'll then decide on what the path forward for you should be to continue with your activities, to slow down for a little bit, a few weeks, uh, speed up to do, to do more resistance training, less, less aerobic work, maybe some more bike work or swimming as opposed to running. What's really important for people is to understand that more often than not, you have a lot of choices. You have time to decide. Very little in my world is an emergency, period. Um, so if I see people with an acute traumatic injury, terrible weakness of the shoulder, they can't move it, or I'm suspicious that they dislocated, I'm going to get an MRI. I want to know if you have a large rotator cuff tear. Uh, if it's tiny, I'm probably not going to say to do something. If it's huge and you're young, I probably will advise it. But again, these are not life and death struggles in the orthopedic world. <laughs> so you do have options and choices. Um, knee injuries, right? If I'm concerned you had a patella dislocation, I'm going to MRI you because I want to make sure you don't have a cartilage injury associated with that. ACL tears, I'll get it not only not to confirm the ACL tear because my exam will tell me that, but to look for concomitant injuries to other structures that may, may need us to address them. Um, but the vast majority of joint pains and aches, they do not require surgery. Many don't require advanced imaging. Mm -hmm. They require us to listen to you, to examine you, and to come up with an appropriate plan. Not blowing you off, not ignoring you. Uh, I'm going to distract you while Mother Nature heals you. Mm. I remember reading um, when I hurt my knee about like chondrocytes, you know, the, the cartilage cells. And it's like similar to how you said, like that they're not only like sloth like, but that they're basically just these like inert kind of cells that don't right. regenerate and they kind of are just like dead almost, which I, right. I, I'm curious if you can like tell us a little bit about. Um, you mentioned that I, I know that some of the cartilage like doesn't get great blood flow, but you were mentioning that it's actually some of the factors in maybe like the fluid around the cartilage cells is actually giving some cellular signaling. And I'd love for you to paint a picture of how like cartilage cells 
are in terms of metabolic activity? Do they have mitochondria? Do they respond to sort of regenerative or anti-inflammatory factors that might be circulating in the fluid around them? And are they kind of this just like dumb dead tissue that we think about that once it's injured, it's injured. And I think the answer is no, from what I've read, but I'd love for you to unpack it. And I, it also just reminds me of how, like, I think we were taught in medical school, a lot of these things like that are very black and white around like brain cells, once they die, they never regenerate. And, you know, once you have a heart blockage, it never changes. And we get a lot of these messages in medicine of like, once it's done or there, it's sort of the cat is out of the bag. You can't go backwards. And I think something I'm starting to feel more and more going into more of the metabolic health or regenerative world is like, there's a lot more complexity to it than we actually realize. <laughs> so I'd love to hear about that from maybe the standpoint of cartilage and um, yeah, just how you're thinking about that. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know, right? Yeah. You know, every time I th I get, I think I'm out of the valley of despair, the Dunning-Kruger curve, you just sort of slide a little closer back to that valley. You know, I should be all the way up on the right somewhere. Uh, but you realize that medicine is far more complex and basic path pathophysiology and biology. Ugh. We learn there's so much more in the textbooks now th than there was when I studied, probably even more than when you studied, it changes every day. Um, we used to just think of cartilage as, you know, this smooth rubbery substance. And right, it, it was dead like a sloth and it didn't really do much and it just wore away uh, over time. Um, and it's not, it's, it's, it's not exciting. Uh, although I must say, when you put a scope in the knee or when you open the knee, it's a beautiful substance. I mean, it's white. It should be white, pristine, perfect, smooth. There's no surface in our body with, with less friction than joint cartilage on joint cartilage. Um, it really is a wonderful tissue. It doesn't like to be sewn. It doesn't like to be invaded. It doesn't like to be hit because it has such a slow metabolism. So if you strike your knee against the dashboard in a car accident now, you may have some pain now that's gonna go away. Three years, you may have a cartilage injury. It may show up on an MRI. It was because of that injury three years ago because it took so long for the ramifications of that injury to reveal themselves. Cartilage cells uh, like to stay by themselves. They don't like others. So they, and they secrete this matrix and matrix is what, when you look at cartilage, that's the white substance and there's mucopolysaccharides and other things in there. And that's what forms this gelatinous, hard gelatinous, smooth surface. Embedded in there are the cartilage cells. They do not have a blood supply. In a non-arthritic knee, they do not have a nerve supply. Um, Late stages of arthritis, we can develop nerves, et cetera, and that's a source of pain, but that's a different subject. So it has no source of nutrition coming from the underlying bone or from blood vessels through the bone into the cartilage. Uh, blo blood vessels and nerves do not cross through the bone that the cartilage is attached to into the cartilage. So they are subject to um, the limitations of what's in the joint fluid whether it's glucose, cytokines, inflammatory mediators, IL-6, which is inflammatory mediator. Comp is a, is a protein that when it's present is a sign of cartilage degradation. Mm. Interestingly, if you're sedentary, your comp levels go up. If you're active, your comp levels in your knee go down. Um, same with IL-6 levels. Uh, so what is in your blood based on your metabolic fitness, health, and what you're eating is what's going to be filtered into your joint fluid. And that's what's going to be compressed into your cartilage. So we, we really are, we are completely connected. Mm. We can't think of cartilage as being different than a kidney, an eye, a mm. heart, or a liver. Oh, that's amazing. So, so, so interesting. So let's dovetail off that and really get into a little bit of um, this relationship between metabolic health and joint health. And we've been focusing on knees, but I, I hope for people listening, like we're really talking about like joints in general. And um, I think that I'd love to hear the framework for how you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier with like uric acid and, and glucose and whatnot, but what are the mechanisms, like the actual mechanisms that relate poor metabolic health to 
issues in our joint. And then on the flip side of that, how does improving or having optimal metabolic health um, change our outcomes for having pain uh, throughout sure. our lifetimes? So the reason why we see people with pain in the office is often two major groups, right? Bony and soft tissue. Uh, the majority of bony issues, uh, joint issues are arthritic in nature. That's osteoarthritis. Um, and the majority of soft tissue issues are tendons, um, ligaments. Ligaments tear or they don't. Uh, they're very rarely a problem other than that. Um, so a lot of shoulder pain is tenderness. A lot of hip pain is tenderness. You may have heard the term bursitis. It's far less common than you think. It's almost always the tendon that's the problem. Mm. We suffer from tendinopathies. So painful tendons, changes within the tendon. Um, a tendon of a 50-year-old doesn't look like the tendon of, of an 18-year-old. Um, we can get tendinopathies. So that's the reason why we have Achilles pain as a runner, patella tendon pain as someone who plays in running sports, um, shoulder pain, that awful pain on the side of your shoulder when you reach up or at night when you roll over, that pain on the side of your hip, it's just killing you. These are tendinopathies. Mm. Tennis elbow is another tendinopathy. Why does everyone between the age of 50 and 65 get tennis elbow? We don't know, but it does happen. Um, so tendinopathies. Um, some of it may be pre-programmed into us, right? As I said, everyone gets tennis elbow. Um, I've had it. It was a short course. Maybe my fitness had something to do with that because it can last nine to 12 months in many people. Um, tendon is made of collagen. Um, it doesn't want to be made of anything else because the strength of that tendon is going to be based on the alignment of that collagen. In other words, take a box of spaghetti, take the spaghetti out, you see all these little fibrils, that's collagen. Break it up and mix it around, that's tendinopathy, where the fibers are going in different directions. There's space between the fibers and there's junk in there because of glycosylation or cholesterol deposits, uric acid deposits. Um, there is all this sludge or junk will occupy space where the tendon should be and it compromises the tendon's integrity. If you overload a tendon, you will develop an overuse tendinopathy. So most running injuries, I'm a runner, I like talking about runners. Most running injuries are overuse injuries, right? We decided we're gonna run faster today or farther today and we don't give ourselves enough rest and a week later our tendon hurts. Well, if your tendon fibers aren't properly aligned, if you have all this sludge and other substance in between those fibers, if the inflammatory burden in your system is higher, and probably if your repair mechanisms are somewhat suppressed by that inflammation, you have the perfect setup to have pain, fraying, tearing, et cetera. Um, now, look, you know, the blowback that I get online all the time when I talk about this, you know, especially from other physicians in my line of work is, what am I going to tell someone, you know, who's 60 year old with a rotator cuff tear, you know, take allopurinol and, you know, and, and decrease your glucose? Well, if they want to live to 90, yes, but that's not going to address the shoulder problem now, right? This is why, as I hope we'll get into, the earlier we pay attention to this, the better we're going to be because you don't want to bring these tendons and this arthritic burden, inflammatory burden through your formative decades mm. and your decades mm. in early adulthood, because they're going to result in problems. These are all area under the curve issues. The longer that you suffer from high cholesterol, yes, ApoB is causative of heart disease and it's worse in the presence of inflammation. <laughs> had to say that. Um, <laughs> the higher your, your A1C is and your glucose is over the longer period of time, again, area under the curve, the worse the downstream consequences are going to be for you. Not only for your eyes, not only your risk of dementia, uh, your risk of kidney failure, uh, hypertension, um, NAFLD or, or fatty liver, but in my world, the higher the risk of tendon-related issues, more severe pain, um, 
uh, tendon tears, uh, overuse injuries, mm. um, and more significant pain with arthritis and other maladies. Beautifully said. Um, I think that's such a fascinating visual. I love the visual you gave of like, here's a tendon with all this collagen and you want it to kind of be in a nice structure formation. And if you start adding a bunch of excess uric acid, cholesterol deposits, uh, glycation through excess glucose sticking to things, you start cross-linking all these things and causing problems in the structure that can make it basically more vulnerable to injury, which is funny. I was just I was on a podcast last night and we were talking about glycation of collagen in the skin and how that's, you know, mm -hmm. part of the etiology of wrinkles. And right. so it's just a fun uh, thing to think about of like, you know, there aren't that many of these mechanisms in the body and they kind of show up in so many different cell types or, or, or different systems and are kind of causing dysfunction all over the body. Glycation in the skin could look like wrinkles. Glycation in the, the ligament could look like just sort of a, a weaker dysfunctional tissue that's more prone to injury. So like we want to, but bottom line, we want to get rid of this, these excess metabolic byproducts that ultimately sure. disturb our tissue and therefore disturb, create symptom and disease. And I, I love that, that framing. Um, and then another one that I, I went to a conference a couple of years ago where the, there was a, an orthopedic uh, person this is actually when I was plant-based and I, I was like fully plant-based. I still love plants, but I was like hardcore and it was a plant-based physician nutrition conference. And one of the things that is so vivid that sticks out in my mind is he basically said that rotator cuff injuries are like heart attacks of the shoulder. And so he was talking a lot about, um, blood vessel, like blood flow as part of these, yeah. the, the link between metabolism and, and predisposition for basically injuries. And I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Like, cause we know that high insulin levels can cause some endothelial dysfunction and, and blood vessels, maybe not dilating as well. So how does that play into how you think about metabolism's relationship to like injuries you're seeing in your office? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And he or she was absolutely correct. The downsides of excess glycation affects every tissue, right? <laughs> yeah. No tissue gets a pass in this. Um, and our cardiovascular system or our blood vessels are terribly affected by the presence of type two diabetes, high glucose levels, high inflammation, the hypertension, mm -hmm. our blood vessels thicken, uh, they're not as porous. Um, smaller blood vessels are gonna close up, they're gonna mm -hmm. disappear. Mm -hmm. um, we have many areas in the orthopedic world that already have uh, very limited blood flow, like mm. part, parts of the Achilles tendon. Um, that's why tears almost always occur at the same level on Achilles tendon, parts of the rotator cuff. So if in the best of circumstances, you have a marginal blood supply, because there are watersheds, right? You have an artery that's coming up this way. You have an artery that's coming up this way. In the perfect situation, they overlap a little. You start to get arterial disease and you've lost blood flow to this area. Where there is no blood flow, there is no cell turnover, there is no repair. You're not bringing in the building blocks to repair that tissue. You're not taking away the dead tissue. It's a dead zone. And that's at high risk for, for, for injury. Um, you know, <laughs> I talk about uh, the effects of blood flow uh, with a lot of patients um, trying to find, right? Everyone's going to have their moment. What's going to stick in their mind as that, that flips the switch, the light bulb moment that says, okay, I understand this. I get this, right? That's, that was the focus of my book. You've heard all this before. You've heard this advice before, but here's why it matters. And here's how it's all interconnected. So what happens to stick with men a lot, and why they want to focus on their metabolic health is impotence. Boom, right? I immediately get their attention because the incidence of impotence is huge. It's a blood flow issue. It's a blood vessel issue. It is related to your poor metabolic health. It is related to your cholesterol levels. It's, it's related. Um, and so, yes, the same areas can be reflected and same issues can be reflected in our tendons and various areas of our body and absolutely will have a role because every time you exercise, run, walk, do things, we get these micro injuries. 
So the tendon will get a little stretched, a little damaged, a little this, but it's okay. Blood vessels, I mean, bl blood vessels are there. They bring white cells. The white cells will remove the damaged tissue. Other, other cells will come in and lay down the building blocks into new tissue and you've repaired it. Mm. But if you don't have the building blocks there because there's no blood flow, if you can't clear the debris because you don't have enough blood flow, you're just escalating the problems. Beautifully said. Love those visuals. I so impactful. Um, I just think this framing of the body is such a dynamic entity. It's not just this thing that's there and it gets hurt. So you have to fix it. It's like, it's this right. dynamic buzzing hive of communication. And I hear what you're talking about is like, yeah, there's different ways to screw up that communication. You can limit blood flow to the area. You can kind of create blocks in communication by having all this deposits of debris. And, and so much of it, as you've so beautifully written about, um, is, is related to downstream of metabolic dysfunction. The blood vessel narrowing or lack of elasticity, the glycation and too much glucose sticking to things, too much oxidative stress, too much in chronic inflammation, which we know is, can be driven by metabolic dysfunction, uric acid buildup, et cetera. So do you, do you find in your practice that when you dig into the metabolic issues with patients and they do have their light bulb moment and they make changes, do you, do you tend to find like better outcomes and not only in, like, like, what has your patient experience been like with some of this messaging and patients who have really adopted this or I don't on the flip side for your patients who are just like super metabolically healthy, do you find that they tend to do better over time? Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, so for me, these are my biggest wins in the office. <sighs> they just are, yeah. you know, and because frequently you're not just changing one life, you're changing the whole family's life right? Mm. You, because they're going to drag their spouse along. They're going, because they're active, they're going to bring their kids outside. Your kids aren't going to listen to what, what you tell them to do. They're going to emulate your behavior. And if you're out there and active, they're going to be active too. Um, so these really are my, my favorite cases. I'm not saying I do it all without surgery. Sometimes that's necessary, say in knee replacement. Um, but we're going to fix I'm not bringing you to the operating room with an A1C of seven, um, elevated inflammatory markers, elevated liver markers, et cetera. We're gonna get you on a path to wellness before we start. And it's going to improve your recovery and then you're going to, to continue on that pathway, hopefully. Look, can I convince everyone? No. Can I convince maybe 15 or 20% who stick with it? I can. Um, and it does work. And it takes time. It's hard. We've talked about this, but modern medicine is not built for this, right? Mm -hmm. We are complex bodies, um, but we don't see any one doctor that puts everything together for us, right? Um, and therein lies a significant issue. You know, you see your cardiologist is going to adjust your blood pressure medicine. Your endocrinologist is going to increase your metformin. You know, your primary care doctor will give you your flu shot. And I'm not, I'm not crushing them. I, I'm, this isn't their fault, right? This is how medicine is constructed. They have to perform. If they don't perform, they don't get paid. Um, and we just, yeah, so they don't have the time. They don't have uh, the ability to sit there and spend an hour with someone with five diseases. Um, so I try to spend the time that I have, and it's usually more than 15 minutes, um, putting everything together, mm. much like I do in the book. I have some handouts in the office of, of outtakes from the book. Um, and when, if, I, if I see someone sit up and I see they're interested, I'll go deeper. Um, and it's not unusual to get some blood tests. And I got to tell you, it's not unusual that I'm going to find, you know, someone with an elevated LP little a, um, or you know, early fatty liver. And I'm referring them to the appropriate specialist because I'm, I'm looking deeper into that. Um, 
I guess the take home message of that statement is, you know, be your best advocate. <laughs> mm. you, you have to look deeper and think in a more, more complex manner because I don't think that modern medicine is going to do that for you today. It's, 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 it's a terrible challenge for us. Yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned like, if you change that patient, you're changing the whole family. And I think the other thing there is that you change that patients, maybe metabolic health through the doorway, they come to you through the doorway of orthopedics, you get them tied into why metabolism matters, but then you're changing their whole body. You know, you're getting at that root cause. And, and I just, I can, I can imagine that as a physician, I, you know, burnout, is at like all time high right now? You know, like it's like over 60% of physicians are burned out. Suicide is super high, da, da, da. And it's like, one of the, I've thought a lot about this as, as someone who became very burned out in residency. And like, I think part of it is that we're just don't really feel like we're making the impact we want to make. It's the revolving door. We don't have time. The incentives aren't aligned. People aren't really getting better. There's a lot of slow worsening over time, you know, despite the interventions we're recommending. And I can imagine that in the way that you're practicing, it probably, I, I would imagine it's, it's a lot of emotional work for you to go that extra level and uh, deeper, but also you see people getting better and you see their whole bodies getting better. And I imagine it's really gratifying, um, to see like really good out, outcomes, like that whole body outcomes, as well as joint outcomes and musculoskeletal outcomes. But I'd be curious, what, what do your colleagues in the orthopedic field think about how you're practicing? Cause I, I see it as quite revolutionary. It's tip of the spear saying, no, we don't just have 42 subspecialties in medicine that all are doing different things. We have common pathways that are affecting all over the body. And if we attack them and approach them and reverse them, we're going to do better, maybe even prevent surgery. But like, that's pretty revolutionary. Like how is your I, the two questions? One, so this will be a big answer. I think, how did you become that way? And how have people responded like your colleagues and also your societies and, and maybe the, the, the departments you've worked for or worked with. All right. So <laughs> I'll end with how I got into this. Okay. Uh, okay. But economically speaking, um, uh, the economics of building and training a surgeon is you should keep them operating all day long. Right. Um, so get an MRI with a positive findings, have them see the PA. The PA will, will tell them that they need an operation. They say hi to the surgeon. The surgeon operates on them and they see the PA and they're gone. I get that. I understand the economics. Um, but yeah, I've just never bought into that. Um, I was, was never the busiest surgeon. Uh, I could have been, you know, I'll have a four or five month backlog for surgeries, but only because look, I've I've been very lucky, you know. I was very smart uh, in terms of my saving investing. I founded a company with two wonderful guys, and we sold it. I was involved with others and had a few exits. So I'm working because I love it. Mm. It's that simple, mm. um, and I really enjoy these interactions with people. Uh, I love the feedback, um, and Sadly, my one regret is it doesn't scale, mm. right? Um, everyone says, I got a few messages today on Twitter. Why don't you, why didn't you fix this? Why don't you, what am I going to do, mm. right? I, you know, I talk to a lot of startups. I advise a lot of startups. I love working in this space. Uh, I like to help people connect the dots and I think I'm good at it, but I don't know how you scale this practice of medicine. Are the way that medicine is today, you know, you're just not going to do it, right? I mean, healthcare is such a huge proportion of our GDP. Uh, everything is aligned against decreasing the numbers of procedures. <laughs> anyway, so. It's a challenge. I've had many different responses from colleagues, um, many who who dismiss me as a snarky old guy, um, <laughs> and many who say, "Hey, can you help me?" And so I probably 
probably have about 40 or 50 fellow physicians mm -hmm. reaching out saying, what do you think of this? Do you have an article on this? I'd like to explore this. I'd like to know more about this. So that tells me that the message is resonating with a number of people. Um, I came to this in a different way than you did. Um, you're smarter than me. Um, because, you know, I trained pre 80 hour work week restrictions, you know, so it was just the most god awful experience I've ever been through. Um, so I should have taken your path, but there weren't even cell phones then, so I wouldn't have known how to meet another founder. Um, I enjoyed being an orthopedist. I was a uh, uh, head of sports medicine at New York Medical College for 20 years, helped train residents, really enjoyed that process. I've always liked teaching, not just patients, but colleagues and students. Um, I was always active. I played every sport there was. I was always outside. I don't sit still well. I enjoy running, trail running, hiking, etc. cetera. Uh, my dogs that are here with me. Um, and then I had my second child and we got a little overpowered at home uh, and work got a little busier, call schedules with raising the child, et cetera. All of a sudden my weight's up a little. Uh, had a little belly pain one day. Uh, I, was, I was hanging out with the chair of radiology. He's like, lay down. He's like, ah, you know, your gallbladder is fine. You just have a little fat in your liver. Like, What's this? <laughs> and, you know, I've weighed 173 to 175 pounds since high school. Then all of a sudden, at this point, I'm 196. Ooh. Still have those pants as a reminder in my closet. Um, there wasn't much in the literature back then about fatty liver, um, but I started to go down all these pathways, you know, what's associated with fatty liver, its cause, um, uh, and I said, oh, <laughs> you know, I, this is your moment, you know, you're turning, you, you're going to turn 40 soon, uh, not quite sure why this is here, but this isn't, is not good for you, so, you know, I cut out all the crap from my diet. Um, I, you know, we didn't have keto or low carb rabbit holes, et cetera, back then. Um, but I just went, I went on a whole food diet. I ate real food, uh, mostly veggies uh, and uh, stopped drinking um, and started running more, exercising more. Uh, I was optimizing for my longevity. Uh, I'd started a website around that time um and at first i was writing articles because i just wanted to share them uh, and tell people what i thought um then uh, i learned by writing mm. uh, and so i started to read about fatty liver i started to read about insulin resistance cholesterol issues etc and then the more i read the more i started to write then I started to publish these, these articles. Same thing I do in the training space. Um, and so uh, eventually I wrote enough, <laughs> enough people said, look, you need to write a book. Uh, one thing had turned into another. I never really had the time to write a book, but then this, this little virus came, came around and I found the time to write the book. Um, and there we are. Um, wow. So I came to this through, like most people probably, you know, my own issues with uh, my health and threatened longevity mm. or health and, span. And then how did you put the puzzle pieces together? You know, you're dealing with some fatty liver, you get things back on track, you become sort of like a newfound metabolic health evangelist. And then how did you start making the link to the orthopedics world? Like, was it just like starting to go on PubMed deep dives or yes. starting to see some patterns? Like what, what sparked your, like what made the connection between, cause it's uh, some, some doctor might get sick and be like, oh, just like most six, you know, 50 or 60 year olds, like I have fatty liver and my glucose levels are going up. That's great. I'm just going to keep practicing cardiology or neurology the exact same way I've always been done. But you actually said, whoa, 
uh, there's a relationship here, but like that, that takes quite a, a different way of thinking. Like, what was that link for you? Yeah, that was very challenging because as you know, from medical school, we're not taught this way either. We're not taught that everything's connected. Um, we're not taught about nutrition, <laughs> diet. We're taught that exercise is good for you, but not why. Um, so yeah, it just took a lot of reading. I just, I just like to read. I like to, I, I found this very interesting and I was incentivized. Mm. I had two little kids at this point, mm. right? I'm a 38 year old with this fat in my liver. I have no idea what's going on. I'm obviously overweight. Um, and I didn't like what I was looking at when I looked down the runway. Um, and the more I read, it just kept going. It kept one thing just balled into another uh, mm -hmm. snowball. And I don't, I don't know why I made the connection to the orthopedic space or the musculoskeletal space. You know, but one day I realized we're, we're not a different system than the rest of the body. You know, just because you have all this big stuff in the center and things that beat and move doesn't mean that everything out in the periphery isn't connected as well. Uh, and the more I started to read about it, the more I realized, hey, it is. Um, and so I read more and wrote more. I love that. Yeah, that's <laughs> That sounds so familiar. I think for me it, in the ENT world, it was like, it felt like such a little silo. It was like, you're just, you're so separate from the rest of the body, ear, nose, right. throat. It's like <laughs> these little teeny places. And I, you're just, there's just no real recognition of like, that it could possibly be related to anything else. And I remember like, for me, it was this vivid, I vividly remember there was a new England journal of medicine article that had like a beautiful illustration of the sinus tissue and all the cytokines that were upregulated and right. chronic rhinosinusitis. And I was like, wait a minute, I've seen right. all these words before, before, like TNF alpha and interleukin six and whatnot. And, and I like, rem I literally opened up one of my med school lectures about heart disease and diabetes. And I'm like, it's all the same cytokines. I'm so confused. Right. Like how is the nose inflammatory response the same as the systemic inflammatory response for this stuff? And then you start going down the rabbit hole. And I remember like, I just started Googling PubMed, sinusitis, diabetes, sinusitis, heart disease, sinusitis, obesity, sinusitis, dementia. And there were papers on all of them all basically connected. showing that you have like twice as high odds ratio for like right. any of these metabolic associated diseases with sinusitis. And I'm like, my, my head, it was one of those moments where you're just like, wait, what? Like, how could these possibly be related? And then of course you can't unsee that. Um, and yeah, so it's just, gosh, it's so, it's such a fun journey and there's no subspecialty for which that type of epiphany Correct. type process can't happen. Because like you said, we are completely unified. Right. system so and then you get to a point where you know you realize it's all connected but how far down this rabbit hole are you going to go yeah right i mean i don't know where to stop it's really fascinating everyone gets about 78 to 80 thanksgivings in their life uh, i've had 60 come next year mm. so i don't have much time left i gotta figure out what the next step is how to try to figure out how this scales how to get this message mm. out there how to teach others. Um, well, I think you have a lot of Thanksgivings left because you literally wrote the book on longevity. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, and are really crushing it, but I love that way of thinking. It's like when, I think when you had an epiphany, like sort of like you have, and it's, you, there is that sense of urgency of like, what, how much, how much can I impact bef during my time to hopefully let others be able to reap sort of the benefits of this way of thinking. And that's, I think writing and your writing is so beautiful. I, your blog has just been such a great resource and I recommend everyone check it out and your book, of course. But, um, to me, that feels like one of the, one of the really big ways to impact, you know, in a way that has longevity, but let's, let's shift gears and talk about longevity a little bit, because, um, I, I think it's interesting how, yeah, how your career has evolved. And now you, you really wanted to focus on this topic for your full length book. So how do you see the relationship between the world you come from, which is orthopedics, musculoskeletal health and the concept of longevity? Can you kind of paint the relationship between those two things? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first off, I think orthopedists are in a fantastic position to identify folks who could benefit from this advice because we're seeing them 
when they may just have some joint pain, but other disease states really aren't escalating out of control. So I think that we can have an impact on them if we can paint the picture of where things are going. Mm -hmm. um, and so I understand the process of sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass, loss of muscle strength, which is gonna dramatically increase the risk of falls, injuries from falls, decrease the ability to recover from falls, increase the risk of frailty, right? You don't have to plan on being hunched over a walker in the age at the age of 75. You can be different. Um, and I, I'm in such a unique position to be able to, to discuss this with people because you're seeing an orthopedist, it's easy to discuss muscles, bones, joints, and therefore function and how function affects longevity and how longevity and health span affect function. Look, you want to live, not only do you want to live more years, you want far more quality in those years, right? You want to remain cognitively intact. We can't forget that maybe half of, uh, half of cases of dementia are due to insulin resistance, right? It's type three diabetes. We want to be functionally independent. Um, we don't want someone to hold the chair, uh, pull, pull our chair out, hold the door open. It's funny, I have a scribe in the office and they're always like, why do you not help these older people up into the bed? Like They don't want me to. <laughs> and they don't, um, unless they have to. And we watch people how they get out of the chair. Do they have to lurch forward or can they just stand up? Can they step up onto the exam room table? Or do they lurch forward? Do they have a little bit of a shake? Are they catching their foot on the ground? There's a lot to be to be seen and gathered by just watching people closely. Um, and I try to turn this into practical, actionable, simple, useful advice. Um, and at a fairly young age, some people really get it you know, 35, 38, 40, especially if they're seeing their parents mm. degrade, um, it starts to make sense. Uh, and you can really hammer home the message that this approach to longevity and improved health span uh, is really important. And again, if I see that light bulb moment, I see them sit up, okay, they're interested, wait, I'll push. If I don't, I'm not gonna push it. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I think I'm really in a great position to be able to start this process, wake them up to the concept of health span, uh, healthy aging, um, staying and remaining active. I love the thing that Peter Tia talks about, the oxygenated decathlon, right? That's how I've worked out my whole life. I have these weight bags, I push them up, I do this, I lift rocks over my head and throw them. Complex movements, I just want to be able to do these things until I'm 80. I don't want to have to stop. Uh, so I'm exercising now to be able to accomplish the things I want to do when I'm 80 and beyond. Mm -hmm. You want to make your terminal decade a lot more pleasurable and yeah. full of, right? Oh, and full of a lot less chronic disease burden. Yeah. I love the concept of compression of morbidity. Um, yes. It's just so good. Like this idea that really... I think we've almost like forgotten that the way it should be is that you're going along with generally like full function your entire life. And then basically right. you drop dead, right. like, and you just like maybe fall like die in your sleep, but you've been living independently and you're thriving, you're mentally sharp. It's like, that is literally my dream. Right. And it, it should be our dream. Like I want to live a perfect, like a very functional life and then drop dead, and hopefully at an old age. And now of course it's literally the opposite of that from infancy, from fetal life, literally from fetal life, we are now dealing with like subcellular pathology of chronic disease and, sure. you know, insulin resistance. And like, it's just a, it's just like a, a diagonal line towards death of decreased function that with a and more epigenetics and epigenetics. Yeah, right? exactly. What we're inheriting. And, and so I just love this concept that you talk about and like the health span and I guess just sort of like a, a big picture question, like just knowing so much about longevity as you do, like, do you think that with the right way of living, the vast majority of people can 
compressed morbidity can live a very long and functional life. And like, if you put in that work, like you pretty much have a really good opportunity to have a very functional last decade. Um, so that, that's the key right there. Um, I don't promise people years. I promise them good years. Good right? years. Yeah. I mean, if I'm dealing with someone who's had four or five decades of really bad habits, it's going to be hard to reverse all the downstream effects of that. Uh, but if we get them weight chain, we get them strong, we fix their balance, we fix their metabolic health so things don't worsen, uh, then we can affect significant change. And we will see uh, a far better terminal decade in that situation. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not buying into the ages of disease that we're going to cure and we're all going to live to 130. I'm, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I guess what I'm getting at is like, I think a lot of people lean on this idea that like, it's bad luck and it's the way it is. And it's like, if we, right. no. if we, from a young age are doing the habits that you talk about, like we're giving ourselves, it's, it's not like lightning's going to strike and we're just most likely we're not going to kind of just out of the blue, get super, super decrepit and sick. Like you make the investments and they tend to, to, Absolutely. to pay off. And, um, I'd love for you to walk through like your, your, this plan that you really present in the book of like, what are the elements of, you know, the simple and actionable strategies that have the most yield in terms of maximizing our longevity? It's really simple. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> right. You know, I like people to create a caloric deficit. Uh, obviously if you're a heavy trainer, if you're a heavy runner, you're running 50 miles a week. No, you, you have to feed your need. Um, but otherwise I'd like people to, you know, we have an issue with caloric excess, right? Um, why does, why can dieting be successful? Cause it creates a caloric deficit. Why does intermittent fasting feeding work? Probably because it creates a caloric deficit. Why does keto work? Because in some people that it works on, it helps create a caloric deficit. Um, so that's a mainstay of maintaining a healthy weight, uh, as you, I know you're a fan, sleep, right? We optimize our lifestyle for eating well. We might drink less. We might say, oh, I got to go walk for an hour today. Well, why the hell aren't you going to bed at 10 o'clock, mm. right? Look, yeah, we need seven to eight hours of sleep. Mm. There are no biological processes. There are zero biological processes that do not suffer from a lack of sleep. You increase your insulin resistance, you increase your, you, know, you get further cognitive decline, you know, you're just Orzo. not sharp, you're not reactive if you don't sleep. Exactly. Um, and so I optimize, and our body likes regimen. <laughs> it wants to do it at the same time. So it's not going to be as happy if you go to sleep 10 o'clock this night, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Look, I'm not saying you do this every night. I'm saying try. The more you keep a schedule, the better. You need to wake up in the morning, go look at the sun for three minutes. No sunglasses, no nothing, right? We got to set a biological clock. We have to give ourselves the best chance possible for success. And if you're going to counteract or go against biology, you have a higher chance of losing that battle. So getting sleep and having a good wake-up routine is super important. Um, I just tell people to eat real food. Um, <laughs> I, you know, uh, I went through a vegetarian phase. Um, I went through a keto phase. I tried it. I wanted to see what it was all about. You know, I think my cholesterol went to 400. I, <laughs> I stopped that. Um, <laughs> so get your protein needs, get your vegetables, fiber, 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 fiber. Oh my God. How good is fiber for us? Miracle. Right? Miracle. Our you cannot imagine the importance of a healthy GI system. You make more dopamine and serotonin, the hormones that make you feel better in your gut than you do in your brain. You will make more serotonin and dopamine in your gut uh, and as a result of exercise than you will from taking that little pill. Um, and what helps feed that gut and nourish it? Fiber, period. Um, it's not just to bulk your stools and give you great poops. It actually does something. The bacteria 
digest it. All the different fibers turn into different short-term fatty acids. Those short-chain fatty acids all have tremendous different effects on our body. So real food. Um, I like people to move. Uh, now, here's where we can overcomplicate things, right? Yeah. Especially in the space that I play on in Twitter, right? You have to do HIT. You have to do an assault bike. You have to, no, you need to move. <laughs> We just need to move. We can't escape the fact that all cause mortality improves with walking as little as six to 8,000 steps a day. Mm. There's no magic to the 10,000 steps. 6,000 steps a day walking and your all cause mortality is improving. Some papers show that it continues to improve up to 10 to 12,000 steps. Some will show that it tends to peter out. There's probably not a reverse j curve effect on mortality meaning that you can do too much unless you're an ultra runner and really pushing the extremes and very important if you're the type of person who has a sedentary job running five miles in the morning and then sitting all day is not how you accomplish being active your body will derive far more benefit from a little bit of activity throughout the day than it will from being active for a longer time or pushing harder in the morning and then being sedentary. Activating our muscles, and it doesn't have to be a lot. Stand up from your desk, do five chair squats. Stand up from your desk, go walk out. Exactly. Go walk out to pick up you know, the copies in the copy machine. Go climb a, a stairway or two. Make your day a little harder. Don't park in the spot that's closest to, to work park further away, just make it a, a point to get those extra steps in because walking throughout the day is super important. And look, much along the lines of what we were talking about too, you know, I've worn a CGM many times. Mm -hmm. uh, I wear them in two week blocks and it's really fascinating. You know, I've done experiments, whether it's with a banana or a soda or something, and I'll sit there one night, I'll just eat this and I'll see what my glucose response is. And then next day I'll eat the same thing and I'll go for a walk. Not jumping on the Peloton, anything, nothing complicated. I go for a walk. And inevitably the glucose variability and the response is blunted. Even simple walks are going to improve your overall health and well being. So it's not just your muscle activation, it's not just your glucose response. It's so important. I like to tell people push and pull heavy things. Mm. Okay, this is really important. Sarcopenia. Sarcopenia should be a four level should be a four letter word because it sucks. It is age program loss of muscle mass. Starting at the age of 35, 40, we lose up to one, we lose approximately 0.8 to 1% of our muscle mass per year. That's at 30, company, starting at 35? In some 35 oh, to 40. I just turned 35. Okay. That's this, right. is um, this is motivating. <laughs> and that that will cause will correspond to a significant loss of muscle strength. It's going to accelerate in your mid to late 50s and into your 60s and beyond. You cannot reverse sarcopenia. Once those muscle cells are gone, they're gone. You can mitigate its decline and you can build muscle mass. So I tell people to push and pull heavy things. We need to do resistance exercise and you need to do legs. I know when we were young, we did chest and arms. Okay, forget that. We need to do legs. Yes, you can do the chest and arms too. Not against it, but your legs are your biggest muscles. They are the muscles that are going to, you're going to derive the biggest metabolic effect. The strength improvement is you're going to get up from a chair. You're going to breeze through movements, you're gonna ease your way upstairs. You're gonna be less tired, less fatigued, more fall resistant, more fall resilient. Mm -hmm. You're gonna improve your recovery. The more muscle you put in your muscle bank at a younger mm -hmm. age, the more you get to withdraw when you're older. It is really hard to build new muscle. It is really easy. It is really easy to maintain muscle mass. So, all that means we need to uh, prioritize leg strength, core strength for our balance. We need to maintain that muscle mass throughout our middle decades. 
and preparation for our later decades if we want to remain active. Now, this does not mean that a 70 or 80 year old should not start lifting weights mm -hmm. because an 85 year old after one resistance exercise se session is going to build new muscle protein. So they should be active and pushing weights too. My parents hate me because I have them, I have them working with trainers um, in their 80s. <laughs> listen, they remark about how much better they feel, how much easier it is to move around. So push and pull heavy things. And now really important, socialize. Oh my God, have a sense of purpose. What gets you out of bed in the morning? Call that friend, don't text them. <laughs> Try to build your social network. You don't have to have a million friends, have two or three that you can really rely on, that you really treasure listening to and talking to, um, that you can go out with, go hiking with, go running with. Um, you will be far better off in the end if you build those relationships and maintain those relationships than if you didn't. Mm, I, wow, those are such beautiful pillars of longevity. And I really love the way you, you say them and frame them because they are simple, but profound. Um, and it's not like you need to do 30 minutes of high intensity interval training per day. And then you need to do, you know, this exact type of resistance training. You're just like push and pull heavy things, like move your body, eat real food. It's, it's kind of like the basics. And I think, especially in the world we're living in now, where like 90% of people are not even eating the recommended dose of fiber per day. And like, what is it like over 90% of people aren't getting recommended amount of exercise per day that we, we, we don't need to, you know, the margins are definitely important for people who are hyper-optimizing, but Absolutely. like, these are the key pillars, right. To like focus on, um, one thing I'm not saying in here, I'm curious, how, how do you think about um, stress, trauma, sort of psychological well-being? I mean, this might, I think this probably fits into sense of purpose and socialization, but yes. um, how have you found that people who are like in your practice who might like be really hypervigilant or stressed, like how does that affect health? Do you, do you find that that plays in? It does, you know, especially in the orthopedic space, because, you know, the hypervigilant, the hyperstressed or will tend to narrowly focus on one problem yeah. um, and the effect that that problem is having on them. When I was a trauma surgeon, uh, we it was very clear we had these two very uh, opposing groups. We would see people have multiple fractures. You spend the night, you fix them. You see them once or twice and like, I'm out of here. Um, I have, I have things to do. And then you see the others. Oh, why me? I can't believe this happened. Blah, 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 blah. Hypervigilant, a little stressed, and they require a lot more attention. And five or 10 years later, they're still your patients. Um, so it does have a role, this is an important group to deal with and to recognize um, and to help them find the outlets, yeah. um, to try and help them de-stress that this is not such a big deal, uh, that this you know, is not gonna require an operation, your life is not over, um, yeah. but yeah, it's the whole package. We can't, yeah, if we're hypervigilant, if we're hyper training, um, if we're mm -hmm. in the top 3%, we can't just choose one or two of these things, right? Well, it's the, we really it's such a good it. roadmap. I just, I just love, I love the way you, you, um, you position it and, uh, and the way it's really, it feels accessible. Um, so a couple more kind of questions that are just, they're kind of a little bit off the wall, but I'm curious if you have any <laughs> thoughts on them. Um, you talked about fiber and clearly you have a passion for for like fiber and real food. Um, do we have any understanding in the musculoskeletal or orthopedics world about how microbiome affects our outcomes with those things? Is that something that's been studied at all? Or, or I just, I know nothing about that sort of intersection. So if there's anything interesting that, that you've come across, I'd love to hear. Yeah, so I've communicated with a few microbiome scientists over the, the year, uh, the last year. There are interactions. They are um, not well studied. Mm -hmm. um, they're seeing, you know, in the blood sugar space, in your space, my God, pronounced effects with certain bugs in your in your colon. Um, 
I imagine as the data becomes more precise and more elaborate and better structured that we're going to see uh, a very clear relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd be too narrowly focused to think it's not going to have an effect, right? Again, all glucose affects all tissues. Why would short chain fatty acids not affect all tissues? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I was wondering is like, has there been that sort of like short chain fatty acid, you know, levels and how that affects pain or something? My hunch, and I'm, I'm at, this is what I'm hearing you say, is that like, it's probably a matter of time before we start elucidating more of those specifics, Absolutely. but mechanistically, like there's gotta be. Well, they affect wellness. They yeah. affect your happiness, your anxiety levels. Yeah. That is going to affect the level of pain that you're going to have. Right. Um, so yes, it is going to be connected in some way shape or form is it directly connected is it causing uh, you know a, a change within our joint structure i don't know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. uh, i hope it is yeah <laughs> There was something, there's a, there's something in the book that we, we've talked a bit about osteoarthritis, but you have a section of the book that's called why you don't need to be concerned about osteoarthritis. <laughs> and I think just for people who might be listening, who are like looking down the barrel of getting older and really fearing like fearing this. I mean, I even have a little fear about it because sure. basically the surgeon looked at me and said, if we don't do this surgery, you're going to have osteoarthritis, which I am not buying into because, you know, I feel amazing now and I believe in the regenerative capability of my body. And so I'm trying to really shut out that negativity, but how, um, how, like wh why should people not be worried, concerned about osteoarthritis? Okay. Um, so there's varying degrees of how the arthritis, osteoarthritis will affect you. Yeah. So by all means, if you've been suffering from it for 40 years and you're crippled, et cetera, we're gonna help you probably with an operation. Yeah. However, more commonly, you have a mild joint ache, your shoulder hurts when you play tennis, it hurts when you kneel down when you're gardening, it hurts when you're out hiking and you're pushing hard up rocks and you're a little worried. You may talk to your doctor and they say, stop that. Don't be active. Don't do this. Uh, that's, you know, we focus on the fact that osteoarthritis, the etiology or the cause of osteoarthritis is more often than not biological. Mm -hmm. And that cartilage nutrition and health is based upon this repetitive loading. It likes the repetitive loading. So there's no reason to stop being active. As we also discussed, we had runners who were less commonly uh, resorting to knee replacements composed as opposed to non-runners with the same degree of arthritis. So we have to do away with the thought that osteoarthritis is a death sentence, yes. is, a terminal, is a terminal disease. It's not. In some of you, it's reached the point where yes, you have no other options available. Surgery, et cetera, can be very beneficial for you, life altering. But the vast majority of people, that's not the case. Mm. And if you can play two sets of tennis instead of three, you know, before you get sore, do it. If you can run two miles instead of four miles, or if you have to fast hike or fast walk instead of running, you're going to do that. You're not going to destroy your joints by staying active. Yeah. Weight training is not going to destroy your joints. Uh, if the pain is mostly in the front of your knee, weight training is going to alleviate the pain mm. uh, in the vast majority of circumstances. So yeah, yeah. take home message. It's not the end of your life. Uh, it's not the end of your joint. And the more active that you stay, the happier your knee is going to be. The stronger you keep your leg, the longer you'll keep your knee. Love Same that. goes for shoulders. Love yeah. that. Such a hopeful message. Um, Okay. Two final questions. One is like, what are your thoughts on some of the regenerative therapies that are happening in orthopedics, like PRP or stem cells, um, being injected into joints, anything there that you're particularly like think is a strong Avenue or is still emerging would love to hear. Yeah. So thoughts. it's a complex topic, right? Um, currently today, uh, the issues with stem cells is you have to try and tell them what to do. <laughs> meaning that you can't just inject the cell you need to inject the instructions so cells migrate through the body according to these instructions or these molecules that they sort of sense like 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 a mouse 
that's following the smell of cheese in the corner of your kitchen, right? These stem cells are exactly the same way. So if we take stem cells out of your bone marrow, clean them up, inject them into your knee joint, they're gonna sit there and look around at each other. And what the hell am I supposed to do now? <laughs> right? Because we haven't figured out how to say, how to stick in the molecule that says, hey, go form cartilage or mm -hmm. go form a meniscus or go form a ligament. Sometimes by injecting them in the, in the ligament, you'll get some factors and chemicals from the ligament itself. But cartilage has, because it has been a very challenging tissue for us to regrow. We've been studying this for four decades mm -hmm. and we're just not there. So now people who get stem cell injections or PRP injections, and it's really bone marrow aspirin mm -hmm. that I'm talking about, they can derive pain relief from an injection. Mm -hmm. That pain relief can last eight, 10, 12, 14 months. Wow. It is not regenerating anything. So you're not growing cartilage. You're not decreasing the chance that you may need a knee replacement in the future. Um, you shouldn't pay $10,000 for it. Mm -hmm. um, PRP, similar. You know, there are <laughs> there's studies and papers that show everything. But unfortunately, there's many different PRP systems out there. A lot of doctors don't want to pay for systems. They'll spin it down in their own centrifuge. Um, some will take it really seriously. And they'll spin it in a specific system for a specific time. They'll actually document how many platelets are in that injection they'll place it properly and you can feel better again with an arthritic knee after or for various types of tendon pain too you might feel better uh, after those injections it may help with tendinopathy it may help with tendon regeneration again because if we're putting stem cells into a tendon we have those chemicals that will serve as that message to say, hey, make a tendon, as opposed to being inside a joint where they really don't know what mm -hmm. to do. So I think the future is really bright. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that future is going to arrive because we really have a long way to go before we figure out how we can message these cells. That's that's really really helpful um, and feels like really balanced uh, insight into that. Cause I think you could go to the websites of the people doing platelet rich <laughs> yeah. plasma or stem cells. And it kind of looks like the panacea, but, right. but I love that idea of like, yeah, we can inject some cells, but they need the instructions too. And we don't, we haven't quite figured out exactly how to like get them to do what we want. And uh, right. that's fascinating. Um, okay. So really just curious as, as someone who is a surgeon, but also someone who has really been focusing on like the, the more biologic aspects of health. Um, so both the structure, you're very much in the structural world of health, but also the biologic world of health. Do you think that there are like a lot of surgeries in your field that probably could be avoided or prevented by people just optimizing their underlying biology and metabolic health? Like, is that a hunch that you have or like that we could probably be doing like a lot fewer if people kind of took care of their bodies and followed the strategies you talk about? Yes. <laughs> Look, I, I can't tell you how many people, you know, I see for a new problem every week and like, Hey, I saw you 10 years ago, you were my third opinion. You said, stay out of the operating room. I did. I did great. So now why does my shoulder hurt? You know, another joint. Um, it is very, something I always say on Twitter, you know, nothing gets better in six weeks. So let's say your knee hurts um, and you're a runner or you're, you're working out. Uh, and you happen to get an MRI um, and it shows a meniscus tear, right? M many runners, most runners my age have these degenerative posterior horn medial meniscus tears, no flaps, loose pieces, et cetera. Um, as I often say, injury can arise by taking out those pieces uh, mm -hmm. if they're not actually bothering the knee. There's a good chance that it may not be what's what's bothering the knee. Sometimes we'll see a capsulitis or an inflammation of the tissue around the meniscus um, because may, maybe it shifted or moved a little. You wait long enough, the majority of you, 
I'm not going to need an operation for this. You just won't. And there have been pl placebo controlled randomized trials of people who had degenerative posterior home medial meniscus tears. One group went to sleep and had the operation. One group went to sleep and had two incisions placed, but didn't have the operation. They both got better. They've put, put them up against, against physical therapy and surgery. They both get better. Um, you know, there's a lot at play here, right? Is it a placebo effect? Is it an intervention effect? Um, a lot of orthopedic procedures up against placebo um, don't fare well. Uh, but I'm not sure how much is going to be true for a lot of medicine, right? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, the bottom line is um, that there are many findings on MRIs where it's easy to convince someone you need an operation. Many times you don't. Um, a lot of my friends and I, you know, will talk about this, especially the older ones, you know, because we are getting wiser, uh, that you'll see people in the office, you know, with shoulder pain and you say, look, you got this tiny little tear, a little bit of inflammation, some anti-inflammatories, a few months of physical therapy, and you should be fine. They go to therapy for three weeks. They hate it. They still have pain. They want an operation. You really shouldn't have it. And then they did anyway. So they choose to have it. They go forward with it. And after four months of physical therapy, they feel great. Mm. Like, see, I needed the operation. No, you needed the four months of physical therapy. <laughs> Look, you know, you, you have to realize, you know, very few things get better in six weeks. Mm -hmm. Tennis elbow, you know, uh, David Rank, great hand surgeon out of UT Austin, I think. Um, you wrote a great article about tennis elbow. You're all going to get it. It's going to go away in 99% of you. And if it doesn't, there's something else wrong other than the elbow. <laughs> but, yet, but look, it's, it's very easy to, some people are really, are really bothered by it, right? We know that steroid injections will often make it worse. It'll change the tendinopathy and, you know, and harm the tendon. Uh, so those are situations where you can try PRP injections, et cetera. But they did a randomized trial of surgery, <laughs> the formal procedure versus ju just making an incision and not doing anything to the tendon and both groups got better. So was it a, was it a denervation effect? Was it a placebo response? We don't know. So many times if given, many issues if given enough time will resolve. Sometimes they don't. I am a surgeon. I do operate. Yeah. <laughs> I operate, you know, every week. Um, so there are things that, that do require surgery. Um, oftentimes that'll be up to you. I mean, again, this is not life and death medicine. Um, and I just think we are more likely than not operating on, on too many things. Mm. Yeah. Because as we get older, things show up on our MRI. It's very easy to take an MRI report and say, look, you know, look at all these things wrong. I can fix them for you. Um, and oftentimes, look, it's easier to have, <laughs> you come into the office, something hurts. It's going to take me longer to convince you that an MRI or surgery is not necessary than it is to advise here, sign here, and we'll fix this for you. Mm. It'll take me longer. And you may not agree with me and you may be more unhappy because I said you don't need an operation. Mm -hmm. That happens. Um, and I'm not always correct. And you may run somewhere else and have a different opinion and have a surgery and do wonderfully great. Uh, you know, I am human. Mm. Uh, uh, but I do think they were operating on too many people. Um, that is so powerful. One of the things I'm taking from what you just said is part of the equation in facing physical challenges like this is actually just tapping into a sense of patience and tapping into a sense of healthy coping. 
because we are an instant gratification culture and in a sense surgery does feed into both consumerism and also instant gratification. We get right. something, it's high value. It's not high right. value. It's actually the opposite of high value, right? It's a very high cast <laughs> for possibly not a great outcome. So, but you know, and, and we have difficulty sitting with discomfort because of just our general Western culture of thinking that discomfort is actually a bad thing versus right. a growth opportunity. And I think I think a lot of this probably does come down to mindset and a little bit of, and, and then another aspect of the psychology is also just a reconception of the body as a dynamic flowing entity that's constantly, that is capable of regenerating versus something that's there to decay and hurt you and cause problems and this and that. So really, I mean, I think what you're talking about, it gets down to a lot of like fundamental framing issues or, um, kind of modern culture things that, that we struggle with in the Western world of like impatience and consumerism and lack of ability of trusting the body and all these things. So I love, I love just everything you said. And I think that there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, and it actually just incredibly speaks to me with just my recent journey that you have, you know, been a huge part of just in, in sharing your wisdom with me several months ago, because, you know, it's like as the knee, I, I had this opportunity on a silver platter to have this surgery. My insurance would have paid for it. I would have felt like I did something and that could have made me feel good about like, oh, I'm taking charge of my health. I'm doing what the doctor recommends and all that stuff. And instead I had to basically sit with a little bit of pain for an unknown period of time. Like this could last six weeks. This could last four months. I have no idea, but I'm trusting in my body and also the clicking, like is it ever going to go away? If I have surgery, I'm pretty sure the clicking will go away because the cartilage will be shaved off probably, but I might, it might never go away. So kind of using that as a mindfulness exercise of like, I don't know, but like, there's no rush. And right. I trust that something that my body can handle this and do exactly what you basically recommend in your book, which was focus on what I can do, which was eat a real food, anti-inflammatory diet, eat lots of fiber, move my body, um, start doing resistance training when I could focus on the things in my life that are good and that are purposeful and voila, four months later, of course, it's, it's like, it's better. And that's not going to be the case for everyone. But I think, um, there's a whole mindset thing here that I, I think is, is important for the American patient to think about, hear about, because a lot of it comes down to us and like our ability to cope with uncertainty. And, and have patience, I think. So and have just, faith. We faith. have redundancy, we have capacity, yeah. and, and we have reserve. So yeah. not every inch of every tendon, ligament, muscle, whatever is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, we we get by just fine. Um, we are not going to look the same on the inside as we did when we were twenty. I don't look the same on the outside. I shouldn't expect it to be on the inside. I'm wrinkled outside. I'm wrinkled inside too. It's okay. Well, you are a huge inspiration for me. I'm so grateful of how you are trailblazing in the field of metabolic health, orthopedics, just so many different areas. You're spreading your word on Twitter. I am so just grateful that you exist, Dr. Lux Howard. And um, thank you so much for being here. Let people know how they can find you on the internet and connect with you. Yeah. Uh, number one is Twitter. Uh, it's my only place in the social world uh, and my website howardluxmd.com it has my email there so if you don't abuse it feel free to send me a message anything we missed today that you want to make sure to get across to the listeners <laughs> there's always more to say um i don't overthink this if you're the average person out there who hates to exercise, thinks of exercise as work, but you're concerned about your health, you don't need an assault bike. You don't need a Peloton. You don't need to, to overthink this. You need to eat well. You need to get yourself to go outside. You need to make your day a little harder. You need to try and sleep better. Um, try not to stress eat as much. Uh, try to find that little win, right? You put the cream in the coffee, you have a donut in the morning or a few Oreos at night. Just find that little win. It matters. Um, and it works in the end. If you're an overachiever, great. So am I. Every now and then, you know, we're going to have an injury. And that's why I'm here too. <laughs>